just be here. There we go. So we're going to be recording this and um, we'll just go through what we're planning. And if you guys have any questions or requests in terms of um, looking around the gallery or seeing any pieces, um, we'll make sure that we do that as well. And if you don't mind, yes, um, muting yourselves just so that we're not getting any ambient noise, that would be fantastic. Thank you. I am just going to bring up the share screen and hopefully go over to um, something that's already up, but mysteriously, here we go, our artist talk. Hopefully you guys can all see now. And we're gonna put it into presentation mode. So, here we are with Fern Nesson, um, and we're just going to do a quick Zoom housekeeping. I'll give you a quick intro to the gallery in case you don't know about it. And then we'll talk about Fern, about the work. I'll ask Fern some questions. We're going to do, this is kind of going to be like a, just a casual conversation back and forth. And then um, there'll be time for Q&A as well. There we go. So this meeting is being recorded. Um, I've tried to make it so that everyone is listen only. Um, I don't think that I was actually successful in that. So we're still learning our way through here. Um, if you have questions, you can feel free to either raise your hand if that's an option in here, or you can use the chat function to write them in. Um, I am gonna put a copy of this onto uh, Beacon Gallery, the blog afterwards. So if you have a friend or who would like to see it, um, it will be there in a couple of days. Um, or if you want to rewatch it for any reason. Um, and if you want to see any artwork in person, I am showing this work. I'm open um, retail hours on Sunday from 11 to 3 and by appointment. So, Beacon Gallery, we are located in Boston, Massachusetts in the South End. We opened in 2017. And we have a couple of different missions. Um, I really started this as an art collector and I was aiming to curate interesting, beautiful, reasonably priced artwork from the Boston area and beyond. But we also do a lot of work with uh, social justice and creating a sense of community as well. And so I consider these artist talks as part of our community creation. So I welcome all of you to that community. Now let's go on to just talking about Fern and a little bit about you. Um, Fern was born and raised in New York City. And as many of you know, she's a fine art photographer with a very unique and distinctive style, which we'll be seeing. She's also a lawyer and an American historian. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts and has her MFA in photography from Maine Media College in Rockport, Maine. Her work has been shown in galleries and museums in the US and as far away as France. Now, I am going to stop sharing this because we're going to, that goes into the images. I wanna make sure that we can admit everyone who's waiting. Hello to our new guests. We're just going through a brief introduction about Fern. Um, and now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the work in perception abstraction in terms of I guess how we initially met and um, how this show came together and then we can just chat from there. How does that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> yes, you can finally get a word in it. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty excited. And we miss having all of you in person. I feel like there's, I mean, it's great to be able to do these things, but there's some sort of, there's an energy that gets lost when we can't all be here together. Um, so this show, Perception Abstraction, is a two artist show with Fern, Nesson and Steven Edson, who are both local artists. And I was introduced to you, Fern, probably like a year and a half ago, I want to say. In two years ago? I, I can't, uh, yeah, yeah. sometimes cold. Right. But that doesn't really, that leaves about three months that it could not have been, and right. that it could have been <laughs> many other times. I remember meeting you at MIT when you were doing this fabulous work at Media Lab there, and being so impressed immediately by the artwork that I saw. Okay. And, um, and knowing that I wanted to help show that work to a wider audience and wanting to create a show that would um, display that 
to showcase that. And I came up with this concept of perception abstraction as kind of an abstract photography show. And one of the things I really love about it is how both of these artists come at photography from completely different angles and I find her very complimentary. And their work has both stillness in it, but an amazing amount of energy. And putting the shows together was a lot of fun, figuring out which pieces were gonna go where and everything like that. And then right as we we're about to open, it was, the opening was supposed to be March 20th and we we're gonna have a party for first Friday in April. And literally that was the moment that everything shut down. And so virtually no one saw this work until about 10 days ago. And that was in a way heartbreaking, I think for all of us. It, it, was, it was a really tough time to come in here. I was in here once a week, making sure that everything was okay. And, you know, we, we luckily, there had been a huge water main break in the South End. I don't know if people were aware of that. And some of the other galleries were filled with multiple feet of, of water and are still not ready to reopen again. But um, this gallery was not, so we were spared that. And um, yeah, we were just clamoring to be ready to reopen as soon as we could. And since, since I kind of put up the message saying that I was accepting appointments, I've been seeing as many people as I can and I've been sharing the work as much as I have been able to. And um, it's been wonderful. It's, it has been a great background to have for, for these many months. It can be Sometimes you get tired of the work and I'm always ready to kind of change it after I've had it for four weeks or six weeks. But I have to say that this work really is so lovely that it's been very easy to live with it. And I think that it, it's a, yeah, it says a lot for, for how great it would go in someone's house as well. <laughs> so um, I'm sure we'll talk more about the works in the show kind of as we go. So why don't we chat a little bit with you now. Um, and can you tell us a bit about your background? Um, sure. I, uh, right out of college, uh, went to law school, became a lawyer, and practiced law for 20 years. And, but I have this feeling always that when a challenge is no longer a challenge, it's time to do something else that's hard. So um, law was wonderful, but I had pretty much mastered what I could of it. And so I decided that I wanted to study American history. Went back to graduate school to do that. and. Again, absolutely loved it and decided to teach. I didn't want to teach in a college. I wanted to teach um, in a high school where kids were generally very badly taught history. And I thought, I'm going to make this exciting and it's going to be wonderful. And, and actually, we had a wonderful time. So I did that for 20 years. And then um, was kind of winding up with that, doing a bunch of college counseling for my high school seniors and then decided I want to do something hard again. Well, art seemed extremely hard, challenging, interesting. I spent my life with a camera pretty much in hand, but without having studied it, I just kept my eyes open and I thought, I I'm going to try this. So one of the people who I see is on here is Howard Greenberg, and he's the head of the a main media program. And I had in my head that my father, who was a fine art photographer years, uh, years back, told me, if you ever want to study photography, you need to go to the main photographic workshops, which is now called main media. It's, it's the best place to do it, he said. So I uh, filed an application and I spoke to Howard on the phone and he said, you've never done this? I said, no. He said, do you have any questions about it? I said, no. I said, All right, do you think you can do it? I said, I can only tell you that I'm going to try. And so he accepted me and off we went. And it uh, was a challenge, but in the most wonderful way. I found, for some unknowable reason, that my camera always pointed at the abstract. That I was really looking to get at the essence of what's in something. What's the life behind it? What it where is the energy in this scene? And to extract that and to make that the subject. The, um, the subject is never what was photographed here. It's what energy that gave off. 
And why do I want to do that? Well, most people, and they do wonderful work, who think of photography as something which memorializes a past minute, the moment that will never come again. And that's great, if that's what you want to do. But I had the sense that there was a, another challenge in, the, in, in using a camera, which was to make a living work of art. That if you stood in front of something, that it would give you a jolt of energy, pass it on, so that you would feel the infusion of life, not the nostalgia for death. It seemed to me that that would um, be uplifting, not only to me, but to people who want to know that our, our energy was here before we were created and will persist after we're gone. And so I kept trying to refine that and see if I could get that, find the motion in a, in a photograph. Sometimes it involves tipping it in a funny way or playing with angles or playing with dimension or you can't tell if it's a photograph is of something minuscule or something large. It's almost like make a mystery that allows a viewer's brain to light up and to start thinking, well, what is this? And how does it move? And if I stand here long enough, will it move? And every once in a while, in one of these, I think I get it, that if you stand there long enough, it starts to move. Your eye makes it move. And I feel so happy when that happens. Mm, so interesting. So that was my path to this place. And it's been immensely fun. I've had to... Um, use every bit of skill that I could find. I'm not a techie. Um, I'm not particularly interested in all the functionalities of cameras or lens. I'm interested in the scene and I'm interested in putting it in a way that's simple and elegant. I love that. It's so fascinating. And would you say that when you started your work and you were looking to abstract it, versus now, how has your work evolved? It's, um, in, I'd say in, in two directions. One, I kind of have gotten to, I used to take thousands of photographs. I now kind of see what I need and I can get it a little faster. Mm. So <laughs> skill has evolved, thank God for that. Um, and the other th way in which it's evolved is I've started to think about abstraction in a big way. These are the distillation of that very deep thought about abstraction in, in the particular way of energy. But I also think there's another form of abstraction, which is to take realistic photographs and use them to connote abstract things. And so I've started to do more work with photographs that are not strictly non-representation, that, that have a bit of representation, but the representation is analogous to something else I'm doing, like analogous to some writing I'm doing that will give, so that they're in a conversation with the writing. And they don't, they're not illustrations of the writing, but they're speaking to the writing. Sure, is it this is like your uh, third Mallory, the Baudelaire series? Yes, for so I, I started with the idea of doing um, a lot of, uh, of translation work. A translation not just of, of from one language to another that you would think of, so from French to English, which I do a lot of, but also translation from other kinds of languages like math mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or science. And um, to have the photographs speak to the ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, that's how it's evolved. So interesting, yes. And I, I am excited to learn more in the future about the um, math work as well, because that's something that I'm, I would like to show also here. I'm just going to um, pin us. If I can figure out how to do that. Yeah, there we go. Um, who would you say are your biggest influences? You talked a little bit about your father. So was your father a photographer in New York City? Was My father a was a fire photographer. photographer. Okay. Yes, his work is very different from mine. He was an influence in that he he said that photography kept him alive and, and excited to be alive every day. He said, I'm always looking for things. I'm always excited to get up and see what I'm going to see today. And he was a very careful craftsperson. He was a master printer and he was about perfection. 
and uh, a great supporter and cheerleader. So in that sense, he was not sort of aesthetically an influence. So the, a funny thing is I started photography without aesthetic influences. I've been a collector of photography all my life, but I don't collect this kind of work, and yet this is what I do. And after I began to do it, I started to see there are other people in the world who think like me. And they, I would call the California light artists, the painters and uh, sculptors, very, do very similar kinds of explorations as I do. Um, also the suprematists, Malevich, Elisitsky, they're about movement and pattern and relationship of forms. And they have a lot to say about it. Um, I came to them after I started doing it myself. And what's wonderful about it for me is I don't feel so much that they're influencing me, but that they're speaking to me, that we literally have conversations across the boundaries of generations and who's alive and who isn't. I read their books and I think, yeah, we are, we're speaking to each other. Here's what I have to say, here's what you have to say. Mm. And it's, it's been wonderful to relate to these people in my mind um, and to, to feel like I'm pursuing similar goals. I love that, that's so interesting. And um, I remember you telling me about a trip that you took down to, I want to say Mexico, is that right? Or, I did, I yeah. went to San Miguel, mm -hmm. yes. So what are some of the, I don't, you don't necessarily have to talk about that trip, but I, what are some of the most meaningful experiences you've had as a photographer? Well, for me, it's, it could happen anywhere. That is, I so it doesn't have to be. always have my camera. It's mm -hmm. right here with me now, and no matter where. So a lot of my photographs are taken inside my house. Um, numbers of them were taken on trips I took, but they don't, as you can see, they don't relate. It's not a specific place. It's really not a specific time. It's more the energy emerging out of that whatever field I'm planning there, I'll find something to shoot, mm. which has been really helpful in this past few months. That is, I don't need a specific place. I love to shoot in museums because it's so easy. They do the lighting for you. <laughs> but aside from that, I'll go anywhere. Sure. Yeah. And you've been able to, so in, this, in the past few months, you've been staying at home, but still finding inspiration. Yes, and doing a lot of writing. And the, the other thing is, that I know you want to ask me, how, is, how do you bring all these careers together? And it, the way is through, here you are, let's call, let, let me call myself an artist, although I'm still a little shy about saying that. But what does an artist do? An artist brings everything of himself, herself, to his work. Everything you know, everything you think, you feel, you've read, Whatever calls to you, you bring it there. And for me, books call to me, ideas, philosophy, um, visual things, they, it all relates. And so having had careers in which I've read an immense amount, enjoyed uh, learning about everything I could possibly learn in math and history and law and literature and French has uh, provides a, a great field for playing off of making photography so so my process is really read then shoot then read then write then shoot then write and that all seems to come together in a way that i haven't had a minute free in the past few months i've been working so hard even confined to my house so it's very interdisciplinary it in is. a way your inspiration and how you work as it, an artist it is and you most definitely can call yourself an artist well thank you <laughs> the work has to stand alone but it doesn't always have to be presented alone. It better have its own, you know, interior integrity. But I also do books in which I combine them all. Because mm -hmm. I think that, or, and video, so that you could come in from many angles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, so kind of going along with that, what do you think makes a good photograph, in your opinion? Uh, well, I would put it very simply. Uh, uh, to me, a good photograph is not a photograph of something. It's a photograph about something. And that's how you know if you've got one. If you have, let's call it an artist statement, you know what you're about and what your goal is, and you can judge your work as whether it's good. Did it meet that goal? And it's, uh, I, I find photographs 
beautiful in all forms. There are people in this room whose photographs I know that they know I adore them. And they're very different from mine. But they are also doing things of photographs about something. They're, they know why they're shooting what they're shooting. To me, if you know it, and you, then you can see, them, well, that one worked and that one didn't, then you're going to be able to find good photographs. Sure. And I think that we might be able to argue that the same thing could apply for almost art in general, right? If a piece of artwork is art that isn't just maybe capturing a scene that's about something. Exactly. And that there's, um, there does have to be, I think, a meaning behind the work to and, really and yet, grab, grip someone. Right, but not a didactic meaning like, this is what you need to know. No. But a meaning that comes from your, your you know what it means to you and you're able to communicate that. Exactly. Yes. Well, it's kind of like that idea of, of, of um, transmitting this concept of like energy. Yes. You know, that, that's behind a lot of your work. It's yes. something that... You know, but I was, uh, I was in Oral this summer, had a show, and um, people came in and they were speaking every, every language. So they were, communication was a little tough. I could manage it very well in French, a little in Italian and Spanish, but then when we got beyond that. So I would, we would get into kind of one-word conversations, and I, they'd say, what is this? And I'd say, what do you think it is? And almost uniformly, I got back, I don't know, but it's energetic. And I said, oh, okay. There you go. And so I, I could see that, yeah, it pretty much is saying what I wanted to say. Yeah, if you can get that description, I would say, yeah. in different languages, that's pretty, that's pretty good. It was, yes, well, I, I, I feel that, you know, you don't need to know any language to look at this. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, and you've published quite a few books on photography. Of photography. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm of photography. Of, oh, yes, <laughs> right. And um, how do you decide the themes of the books and what you're going to put in them and what's going next? I've just got this tremendous curiosity about the process of abstraction and who uses it and how they use it. So first I started with math. That's what mathematicians do. Mathematicians will, they, you remember first grade, you have four oranges, I'm going to take three oranges away, how many oranges have you got left? And then they stopped saying oranges, so it was four minus three is one. So that's a form of abstraction, and I thought mathematicians do it, so I started studying math and um, reading um, theoretical math of every sort, from the theorem of calculus to the, you know, the different models of infinity, et cetera, looking at how mathematicians abstract things. And then I put it into uh, eight essays about abstraction and math, and a few essays about, with, accompanied by some of the photographs, and then a few essays about wh what are the parallels between abstraction and math and abstraction and non-representation of photography. So then I look for another subject that, that exhibit in which you met me at MIT was called E equals MC squared, in which I was looking at abstraction that physicists do about time and space. And uh, how does that relate to the kind of abstraction that artists do? Um, I did the same project with translation, but every time I do it, I write about it. So it makes a natural book because you've got your writing, you got your photographs, wow. there it goes. <laughs> and, um, very proud of the first book I did, uh, which was called Signet of Eternity. It was about my father's death and losing him. And uh, on that one, I really wrote about, just about abstraction and photography. Mm -hmm. what, what it could mean to make a living work of art in terms of the comfort that it gives you that the people you've lost are still all around you. Mm. And the reason I say I'm very proud of it I think it's a beautiful book, but it just won a wonderful award for being a beautiful <laughs> book. And so well, that I felt great, like, you know, hey dad, we went on a That's amazing. Yeah. Well, congratulations for that too. Yeah. Wonderful. If people are looking to acquire one of your books, where can should they contact you? Or? Uh, yeah, absolutely. They're also for sale on Amazon. Some of some of right now, um, that book, Signet of Eternity, is for sale. And I've just uh, finished a book called Word, which is a memoir with accompanied by photographs. That's up for sale. And I've got another big one coming out on uh, Baudelaire and translation. Amazing. You're prolific. 
Um, and I'm just looking here at, at some of the other questions, but I feel like you, you've covered a lot of the different topics. So maybe it might be nice, especially because it's almost 5.30 as well, um, to do a little tour of the gallery. Whatever you like, and Laura, I'd love to answer anybody's questions. And why don't people comment and we can see if anyone, what would you guys like? Do you want to ask, ask some questions or do you want us to do a little tour of the gallery? What do you guys think? Let's see if anyone wants to type an answer in here. Let's see the show. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I'm going to try not to make you guys seasick as I um, bring this. I'm going to try to bring this. I'll around. let you do it. it. And you can just ask me from here. Okay. So, Brenna's going to stay here. I'm going to very smoothly. I'm going to go to kind of the start of the show and we'll just kind of go around. Um, okay, great. Pardon me. I'm going to be off to the side. So just, just so everyone knows, this is the entrance to Beacon Gallery here in the South End. As you come down the steps, there are three works that you see. We have the title of the show, and then we have these two beautiful prints here. Um, the one closer, probably to everyone's left, that's darker, is one of Fern's. Um, Fern, this is a unique one of yours because it's one of the few where I think you painted with light as opposed to paint to photographing something that was um, stationary. Yes, I, I did. All I did was jiggle the camera. You jiggled the I camera. I like. Yes, Fern has just made a circle. And um, hope for the best. You hope, I like that. Well, I, I think it's a fantastic piece and I love the way that it looks next to Steve Edson's work that kind of acts as a negative to it that is photographs of wires. If anyone has any feedback on how this is going, please let me know if there's anything that's too hard to hear, anything like that. Then we have this piece that's up against the end cap of the wall. I'm just gonna walk around. Fern, if you have anything you'd like to say, let me know. These two pieces, I loved putting, these are the other two pieces that were painted with light, we shall say, that I put together where Fern moved the camera. And I just love the way the lines just flow right into one another and the colors. And then one more piece. We have a little back room here that's filled with Steve Edson's work, but we have one piece here in the hallway as well. I've always wondered, for if you're willing to divulge it, what is this a photograph of? Well, here's what I have to say. I can't remember, which it, to me is great. <laughs> I wonder too. Please go back to the piece with the, the, piece with the blue. I've had a, a request. Okay, the piece with the blue. This one I was doing. Yep, can go back over there. I am your servants, everyone. So this is one of Steve Edson's pieces with the trees, taken in Watertown Square. And then we have these two pieces here. Do we have any questions about these? Oh, thank you. So I've gotten the comment, nice pairing with the others. I'll, I'll Scroll back so you guys can see this a little bit more clearly. So these are flanked by a automobile grill and a architectural detail in Chicago that are pieces by Steve. So I'm gonna now turn this and we're gonna go to the wall that really features all of Fern's work. Starting here, this is honestly, my favorite piece. I love green and I just love the energy. There you go, energy in this work. I love the way that it complements Steve Edson's piece as well, the two of them together. Everyone can see that. The two of them in this corner, the colors, the energy, the diagonals. And as we go through, we just see these amazing, gorgeous colors 
mysterious lines. And it just never ceases to shock me that none of this is done digitally in the sense that you haven't manipulated any of the images. No. This is all captured with your lens. Now the next picture, I know you have kind of a, a cute story about. This one is the only one that people say can be identified. And yeah, if you live in Boston, you kind of get the sense that this was in one of the tunnels to the airport, and it was. And I was, uh, I was very happily stuck in traffic in the tunnel. My husband was gnashing his teeth, but I was so excited. I never, <laughs> I never get to stop and take photographs, and I want this photograph so badly. There you go. So you got your photograph. I did. And we got this amazing disappearing perspective on these fabulous lights. This piece I think we discussed. I love the, the light in here, but this is a bit of a mystery where this one has come from. But the bright white edges are fabulous. I find myself often contemplating this piece. It's like a secret language. Mm. It, it, I use it in, the, in my translation articles because that's what, if you don't speak the language, that's kind of what you're looking at. Something that looks like you should know what it is, but you can't. I like that. I believe this is one of your favorites. Is that right? Turn yes, on. that to me is, is my favorite. And this one is definitely in the sun, so hopefully it'll still be visible. It's another beauty. So this is right up at the front of the gallery. We have these little windows. You get like a full sense of what we have here. A large piece by Steve Edson. So this is the front that just looks out directly on Harrison Ave. So I'm not over on Thayer Street with everyone else. I'm a little bit down. This is another piece by Steve Edson. I'm gonna turn back. You can kind of see where we are at the front and give you a sense of what the gallery looks like as we look back. So you can see that big long wall with fern. <laughs> we just have two more pieces that are the ones right at the entrance. See if we can get the, the light balance good enough so that people can properly appreciate them. So we have these two pieces, which I love, and I love putting them together because of the similar shapes. There you go. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you decided to frame them? Because you did something quite unique with those. And we're going to sit back down for now. If anyone wants to see anything, you could certainly take that around again. But I, I spent a lot of time um, deciding how to frame my work. I, it, it, it's not framed behind glass. I'd like you to get the sense that the form and the energy is emerging out of space, that there's a lot of space and it's just pulsing at you. And the glass creates reflections and, and interferes with that. And then I wanted to um, always have a black background so that it is emerging from space with lots of room around the image. And I put them at the back of a box, I had boxes made and put them at, pasted to the back of the box. Again, to give as much depth as possible. And also so that when the gallery lights hit it, you, you might see the shadows don't get in the way from the gallery lights always create shadows, but they don't make a problem in line because there's enough black so that the shadow falls in the black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, so, so in a way you can't see it and so it, it can't be demonstrated because it's absent here. Exactly. Correct. And so it, that was the best I could do. The other way that I would do it in a, it, well, that I do it in my home where I have a room painted black 
pull the shades down, tiny spotlights just on the photos. Then you get a sense of really you're the zooming from outer space. But, um, but that's not possible in a gallery. So this was my way of recreating the black box that would let you feel that it was emerging yes. out of the door. And um, correct, Ellen and Howard, these are framed without glass. The mm -hmm. only two that had a glass are the two pieces in the middle on that one wall where I showed you that kind of have the lines going across. Right, and I would do that without glass too, but it so happened that I had put them in behind glass for my husband to display at Harvard Law School, and I didn't reframe them. Gotcha. They're, so those they look beautiful, but yeah, they do. And it shows that they can work in kind of more traditional frames as well. It really is up to the ultimate. Yes, I mean, with museum consumer. glass, you get you don't have quite the problem that you would with regular glass, but on the other hand, it also kind of dull the image. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit, uh, takes down the brightness. So I, this way makes them, they, they do the best they can. Yeah, it's interesting. The show is almost completely no, no glass. It's photography, but all the work, save a few images is standing alone as works on aluminum, works on paper, but not with glass in front. It's unique in that way, I would say. And I think it looks beautiful. It feels really. very present. Yeah, it feels modern, feels present, feels fun. Yeah. Um, and it just shows, I think, the um, flexibility of what photography can do and can be in terms of an art form. Mm -hmm. And no maps. I should yep. mention that I don't see why, I almost don't see why anybody maps for but for these, they wouldn't work at all. They would just, this, no. is, this is energy, not precious. You're not confining it. Exactly. It would be more confined, I think, with a mat. Right. And yes, I think we have a couple comments here saying, it, which other people are seeing, but you probably are not reading, makes works look more painterly without the glass. Yes, sure. um, and more accessible, someone else said, and more present in the room, which I would agree with all of those things. So yeah. I thank everyone for their Well, I'm glad that worked. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad everyone likes our choices. So <laughs> yeah. 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 Curatorial choices yeah. here. Well, I have to say, you've been incredibly flexible in terms of, you know, size. Size is always an issue with my work because I shoot a lot at night, and if you blow it up, too big. It just, again, it just doesn't work. You, just, you know, you don't get anything clear. Yeah, I think that coming at it as like having my own personal kind of like artistic hobby being photography. We have so many things in common, both speaking French and loving France, I would say. Um, writing, both enjoying writing. I have a great affinity for history as well. And then the photography thing, I think I understood that there's just, there are limits. Yeah. It's like you just you get to a certain point where if you ask a photograph to do something that it can't do, mm -hmm. there's no point in a way. And, and, and I have felt with my work that it might look great, very large, but I, I, the part, the ones where I have more trouble is sort of the middle of ground. Very large, very small, I think. Mm. It might be fun to see if you could do that. What you probably would have to do is get into Photoshop. You know? Probably. <laughs> And yeah. to, just to make sure that those potentially like yeah. black stay super black, and, yeah. you know, in terms of like the ISO. It's everything. really hard. I've tried projecting yeah. them. They Digital. look terrible projecting mm. because the light's coming from the wrong source behind it. They graze everything. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's always fun. I mean, I think this is always a sense of like, you know, playing around with it. Right. <laughs> I like it. We have nice work, Fern. Thanks for zooming since we can't go to the gallery yet. Yes, I'm hoping some of you who are out there can come and make an appointment. Hi, Hi Ellen. Ellen. Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, are there more questions as we're going through here? Not unlike early non objective painting. Hmm, interesting. I like that. Did, so I think this is a great size for the work, not unlike early non objective painting. Well, thank you, Howard. Um, yeah, I think that, that's an interesting. I don't, I would have to look up. So, Malevich and stuff, you would yeah. be about similar yeah. sizes. Mm, interesting. Definitely. Lisitsky, I mean, they were like this size. A lot of work that Lisitsky did was for magazines, so that they, yeah, very similar. 
Yeah. Um, the work is up until July 12th, although I must admit that um, I currently intend to, fingers crossed, spend some time on Cape Cod that last week of, you know, around July 4th with my family. Um, I'm only an hour away though, so if anyone does want to come into the gallery for a visit, all you have to do is email me and I'll come back. <laughs> so, oh, I have someone who is trying to join. Um, so I will come back for any sort of you know, gallery visit. I'm not that far away. Um, I probably will not be here July 5th. 4th and 5th might be the only time that would be a little bit tough. Um, and then we have a question. Um, Fern, I may be misremembering, but did you experiment with backlighting the work? I did. And? And it doesn't work. No? I put it in light, on light boxes and the blacks go, turn gray. And with that, the deep black is really important to the energy of the image, I think. I, I, I mean, it could be deep blue and that would be wonderful, but to me, um, if we're talking about energy persisting in the universe, we, wanna, we have to face. There's a wonderful line in the uh, Tao Te Ching, can you open your tent wide to the firmament? sort of a challenge saying, are you brave enough to look at infinity mm. and deep space? And who can be brave enough to do that? The only way to do that is to say, well, I'll be there someday. Might not recognize myself, but that's where I'm gonna be, and I've gotta to get to like it. And that is the blackness. So face the black, and anything that backlights it takes it away. What has worked for you, though, I know is, um, digitally reproducing the work on screens, right? The That's screen, on the really screen, well. it looks great. And so I've done a number of videos. And mm -hmm. the next show we're doing, I hope we'll have one of the videos. Yeah, the Light of God video. And that, um, the, uh, computer screens are, are very seductive with this work. They give you the sense that you can reproduce almost anything and it will look wonderful. But it turns out that sometimes it looks the screen does a better job than the printing. So I've had to take some photographs that I really love and just not be able to, to show them in print form. Interesting. So I love this video because you get to make, use it for something else. Sure. Yeah. I wonder if you've ever considered, I mean, with the advent of new technologies such as like the frame by, I would say, Samsung or something where you have TVs that when they're not on can be used kind of as, as pieces of artwork where you can project. I do have some of them. I have some of those at home and they work well. Oh yeah, and do you, do you have your work projected on them? Uh, yeah, I have, yes. They work really well. Those little frames that you use for you know, your family snapshots where somebody sends you some and you just... Sure, so that's one thing. And then, board, and then there's yeah. the... Yes, I would imagine because I... Or the large like screen. Have, or the large screen. Yeah. And that works well. That, that works that. really well. So those would be fun. I, yeah. That's something I think um, I find fascinating as kind of a future frontier for our work is, is digital artwork, digital videos. Yeah, well that um, is definitely possible. I just, there's only so many things you can do <laughs> and study at once. So <laughs> we have, can't wait to see the video, agree, beautiful, lots of really wonderful comments. Um, any other questions here for Fern? Um, for me, your well-designed show, since you collaborated for the show, have you discussed a book collaboration? Oh, that would be fun. We have. We've talked about the mind of God. <laughs> <We're gonna laughs> That's going to like, yeah. we got to get that out. We're, that, that show will be coming out next. I think we should do something on, we should do something on like Paris as well. So. We'll at your service. <laughs> <laughs> I, spent Paris six, I spent six years living in, in Paris and, and uh, also speak French. And Fern was kind enough to um, send me some images for an upcoming uh, workshop I'm doing on the museums of Paris. So I think we, we both have a great affinity for the city. So we'll see, we'll have to, I, I think our, our collaborations are far from over. That's excellent. Is, is the, uh, is the gist of it. Um, so we should let people go. Yeah, I think that probably we're gonna stop there unless anyone has some last questions, but um, I wanna thank you all for attending. This was really great to see all these friendly faces like I said, this will be um, online for anyone who'd like to have a second look. 
and come and visit. There's also on the blog a tour of the show that's in photographs. So if you go back a couple of posts on uh, go to Beacon Gallery blog, uh, beacongallery.com and then flip over to the blog, you'll see that there's a tour of the show there with um, some still photographs from it as well, if you felt like you didn't get a good enough look as we were going around. And we forgot my other windows. Oh yeah, and then we can go to our, I'll put a link up to that. So yeah. Fern also has a um, solo online exhibition at artsy.net right now um, that we put up to kind of in reaction to the pandemic because none of this work really reacts to that. Would you like to give that a... It's a show called Windows and it's, um, we see everything in this past few months through windows and then we get images of the world coming in through our windows. And so I put together a bunch of photographs responding to the world as framed by windows. And Christine was kind enough to put it up as an exhibition. Yeah, so that's up on Artsy right now and there's a link to it from the website as well. So, oh, thank you, so. Thank you, and it's so wonderful to see so many friends. Yep, so thank you everyone for coming um, and hope to see you all at a future event or in person. All right, take care everyone, bye.